Well, I'm not a chemist, and uh, I dare say, you know, these things, it's dangerous because these things use reactive solvents and stuff like that. It's possible that out of the same set of plants that the uh, ayahuasca analogs can be prepared, that it you could concentrate DMT out of Desmanthus elenoiensis or Socotria or Phalaris or something like that. For those of us who aren't second year students in biochemistry, this is probably um, the way to go. The other way to go is to try and find a chemist and inspire them to make it. I mean, I know it's not a terribly satisfying answer, but on the other hand, if there were a terribly satisfying answer, there wouldn't be the question, would there? Are you talking about concentrating it in the Soak it, boil it, dry it off the water? Well, no. The way you would do it, if you were serious, is you would get a piece of apparatus called a soxlet extractor, S-O-X-L-E-T. This is a piece of chemical glassware, and the way it works is it has a bulb. Uh, you, you hook it, you plug it in through a ground glass fitting. You plug it into your solvent uh, vessel, which is sitting on a heater, and it vaporizes the solvent. The solvent is carried through a tube past the soxlet and up into a, a uh, condenser the solvent then liquefies, it drips down onto the sample, which is in a little thing which looks sort of like a, a condom or a toilet paper tube or something. Anyway, it's a, a cylinder with a rounded end that you pack with the sample that you're extracting. And the Soxlet, which was undoubtedly designed in Germany um, by somebody very clever, uh, the hot solvent falls on the sample and the sample gets more and more immersed in the solvent. Well, then when the solvent is above the level of the little um, sample holding filter tube, there's a little, there's a little pipe on the side of the soxlet which leads back down into the, to the vessel on the heater and a kind of siphon automatically cuts in. It's a passive thing. It's just how it's designed. And the the hot solvent, it goes and it just sucks all the solvent off the sample and drops it back in the lower flask. And then the hot solvent begins pure. No, no, nothing is dissolved in it because you know when it, when a solvent vaporizes, it uh, leaves all the other materials behind and you run this, they call it refluxing, you reflux the sample for two or three hours, and at the end of that time, you can be fairly confident, if you've chosen your solvent correctly, that 99% of what was in the uh, is now down in the solvent flask, and then you just unhook the solvent flask from the apparatus, take that, and evaporated, and then you get a pure, a, this is called, uh, the liquid then in the flask is called the mother liquor. It is a whole alkaloid extract. Every alkaloid in the sample is now in solution in this stuff, and then you can either simply drive the solvent off, and you'll get a, a probably a dark, brown, reddish-brown tar of some sort that you can smoke, or if you really are a, um, a, um, a, um, <laughs> oh, wow. I saw a guy smoke DMT in the forest in Hawaii, and one of these metallic bugs came and hovered right over him for the entire trip. Anyway, you can then you have this red tar which you can smoke, but if you want only the DMT and want to separate it from the other alkaloids, then there's a further series of steps, which is you get um, um, 
chromatography paper. You, you know what this is? And you, you uh, pour the solvent into like a petri dish, suspend the chromatography paper so that it just touches the solvent. And do you all know and understand the principles of chromatography? Doesn't it wick up a surface? Yes, it wicks up through the paper, which is very porous, and compounds of different molecular weights will deposit themselves at different levels in the, in the chromatography paper. And then with an ultraviolet light, or sometimes you can tell with your naked eye, it depends on what you're looking for, the DMT will all, like, like say, the DET will be at three and a half inches, the DMT will be at four inches, the monomethyl DMT will be above that. In other words, they fractionate out. And then what you, you do this, and you save your chromatography papers, and then when you've, il when you've um, used up all your mother liquor in this way, then you take a pair of scissors, and you go through and you cut out the inch wide strip where all the DMT located in the filter paper. And so then you get a, a bunch of little pieces of paper which have, are saturated in DMT. Now you put them in a, a clean, um, this thing, this condom-like uh, filter, it looks like a bullet. Uh, you put your chroma, the little sheets of chromatography paper in there, run a solvent through that, and this time when you evaporate off the solvent, you will get uh, a pure enough compound for, for uh, your purposes. I mean, it will be 98, 99% pure DMT. I mean, this may sound like a lot of hassle, but on the other hand, we're talking about the key to the mysteries of life and death here, so <laughs> the effort doesn't seem too heroic. So you're talking about a solvent. <laughs> How do you know what solvent you use? Well, um, you, you can look this up in a standard chemistry book. Oh, the cautionary word here is that high molecular weight solvents are flammable. Uh, chloroform, ether, use these things very carefully and always in an open and well-ventilated place and for God's sake don't heat your flask on a gas stove. No open flames allowed. Use the, a hot plate or something like that. Professional chemists have what are called bird nest heaters which are these things which look like bird nests of various sizes that the the flask of solvent just very nicely snuggles down into the bird nest heater and make sure that there are no ungrounded electrical connections around. Ideally, it should be done outside where the moving air can disperse the solvent. You don't want to make a fuel of yourself. You said this morning, uh, if since DMT is so difficult to get that psilocybin, uh, if you have more than eight grams, or eight gram at least, that you would get a similar or the same effect? Did I understand? Well, I said that sometimes on high-dose psilocybin, sitting in darkness, breathing and, you know, working it, massaging it over hours, you can break in to these places. But of course, there's a number of extraneous issues here. You have to... The one thing about the DMT flash is that it's mercifully quick, mm -hmm. so there isn't any time to panic or begin to think about the implications of it. It's just a white-knuckle trip through it, and then <laughs> you're out. Um, I, I think... I mean, my technique is to try and inspire chemists to make it. You know, and I always tell people, people say, where do you get it? I always say, when you find it, call me first. <laughs> and I, to chemists, I say, you know, when you make it, call me first. And I think this will, uh, this is an effective method for those of us who aren't uh, inspired biochemists. <laughs>